the first major global summit on AI, artificial intelligence safety. It is uh, being held right now uh, in the United Kingdom this week. And our next guest wrote an op-ed in the London Times about how this gathering can reset capitalism, making it more inclusive. Joining us right now is Lady Lynn Rothschild. She's the uh, Council for Inclusive Capitalism founder and CEO. And good morning to you. Um, tell us about this op-ed and tell us how you think AI can make capitalism, if you will, more inclusive. What are you arguing? Thanks for having me, Andrew, and greetings. Greetings from London. Um, first of all, it's a great achievement of the British government to convene global leaders from the G7 and China, as well as the biggest technology companies in the world and the best universities in the world thinking about AI. So this is a great achievement. Um, it is a first. I am sure it will not be the last. I am sure the United States and the United Kingdom will work together on AI. But Britain stated its purpose for this meeting as AI safety. And I say that that purpose is way too small. Because AI is going to change everything, for good and for ill, I say, why aren't we asking, how can AI address the structural deficiencies in our economic system? How can AI make our economy work for all? How can AI create a society where it's not us and them, but it's where we all equally believe that the system works for us, just that it works equally. That's all that anyone wants. And government regulates here, technology innovates there. But I'm calling for a joint declaration of the private sector and the public sector to the common good. It would be the first time in history. This has never happened. Right. And when you think about the power of both, you think government, what's going to happen is that government's going to produce a communique, and the technologists are going to produce, as they have, a techno-optimist manifesto. But where is the public in that, and why should the public believe right. in but it? Lynn, Lynn, um, but here, I am here's, calling, yes. here's the, I think the, the thing I think I'm trying to understand, though, about how this would work is one of the, the great worries about AI technology is there are obviously the safety issues and misinformation and all of that, but also what it's going to ultimately do to the economy. Now, some people think it's going to supercharge the economy and make it much more productive. But by the way, much more productive might leave even more people behind. So the question is, how can the technology itself or the companies that are operating uh, these businesses make it more inclusive for more people if, in fact, we think that what it's ultimately meant to do is make people more productive, but that means less jobs? That's why, that's why, Andrew, I'm saying we have to think about our essential social compact with society, that it's not about productivity, about privacy, about any of these very important issues. But what is our foundational belief? King Charles made the mansion speech this, this week, uh, two weeks ago. And in it, he said, have we asked about our responsibilities to each other and to our communities? That's where we have to begin. And then we will deal with how do we make our society more productive with all of the magnificent benefits that there will be from AI, but take care of the people who are not part of it. Do we, do we create more jobs for carers? Do we change our economic incentives so we're no longer giving deductions for carried interest, but we're giving deductions to companies who create gain sharing for workers? There are so many changes. That's why I'm saying it's a root and branch reform of the economy, and there's no better place to start than with AI, since AI is going to be this Lady Lynn, amazing, if, 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 magical. If, if, if I was, Lady Lynn, if I was going to put AI at something to highlight, with 50 or 60 percent of college kids thinking that maybe socialism is a more effective uh, economic model than capitalism, I would point it. I would point that lens that you want to focus on the, the shortcomings of capitalism on the de facto uh, shortcomings of socialism and the shift that we're seeing. That we don't need 
I don't think people pointing out more that, oh, well, you don't do this because of capitalism. We don't do that. Why don't you try to educate the, the, the college kids that socialism and the drift into what you're proposing is the real danger at what we're looking at, not the nitpicking some of the things in capitalism that might cause people to feel an us versus them. The, the best way to prosperity is free market capitalism. Why don't you point, why don't you try and you know, get the 60 percent of college kids that think socialism is a viable alternative and crush that notion? Joe, you and I are on the same exact page. What I am talking we about are. is you saving are. capitalism. We are on the same page. It's, it's, uh, capitalism is fine, I've never said that to you before. That's why you people, are, that's why people come here. Capitalism, no one's trying to get in there. But no one's trying to get to, to, to places exactly where they're right. socialist. That's why they want to come here. I mean, you that, can work exactly around it on right. the edges, but Lady Lynn. You, 60 percent. Go ahead. This isn't the edges. I'm talking about root and branch reform. That's 60% of young people. You cannot take that fact for granted. That is saying something to you. Your idea of free market yeah, we, capitalism. We, we need some new professors um, that, that don't really preach anti Semitism and that don't. We've we got to root a lot of them. Lady, Lady Lynn, the other thing that I just Whoa. wanted to ask you about was is you've been, you've been talking for many years, and we've had you on the broadcast uh, a, a, a bunch before about the idea of inclusive capitalism. But one of the things that's happened, and you and I have talked about this, I think, on, on TV and, and, and off air as well, is the backlash that has come from companies doing anything more, frankly, than focusing on profits, right? I mean, we've seen what's happened even the last several years around diff different companies that have spoken out on either, either spoken out on different issues or tried to readjust their, their business models. And what's happened? We've either seen politicians uh, come and there's been a backlash, or in some cases, shareholders have come in, so, uh, w with a backlash. And so the question is sort of how do you even begin to do this? Well, I think begin is the, is the point. That's why I'm saying we have to have a declaration where business and government together make a joint statement to the public about why capitalism, understood to be for all the people, is the right. best system in the world. And that's not free market uh, alone. It's free market that's dictated by, as Adam Smith said, morality and and ethics, and that's all I'm asking for. Right. And I am not pro a proponent of socialism. I right. am trying to make capitalism truly the greatest system in the world. 